Hello, this is Professor Kitch. Welcome to my webcast on laboratory procedures for the one-dimensional consolidation test. When you complete this webcast, you should be able to describe the components of a floating ring consolidation cell and describe how to prepare a specimen for one-dimensional consolidation testing. This webcast covers lab procedures only, no theory. Before you watch this webcast, I highly recommend you watch my previous webcast, which covers the theory of the one-dimensional consolidation test. The link for this webcast is listed on the screen now. Hello, this is Professor Kitch, and welcome to my webcast on the one-dimensional consolidation test. In this webcast, I'll show you how to prepare the specimen for testing and how to run the test. I'll have a separate webcast on how to reduce the data from the lab. So let's get started do a quick overview of the things you're going to need for the test. You'll need your data sheet, of course, you'll need your consolidation cell, and then you'll need this tray that has the accessories for the cell. I'm going to briefly show you how the cell is assembled as an overview before we start the test. This is the cell, and on top is a retaining ring which holds down the specimen underneath. Underneath that is the specimen ring. It's a stainless steel ring which will hold the specimen being tested. Underneath that is a porous stone that goes in the bottom of the cell. So the assembly goes like this. We have our cell with the porous stone in the bottom. And then I have this stainless steel blank which we use when measuring machine deflections. Right now we'll use it to represent the soil. So I'll show you later how we trim the soil specimen to the ring. For now, assume this is a soil inside of the ring. We take a piece of filter paper and put it on top of the bottom porous stone. We'll set the ring with the specimen on top of that and then make sure that it's centered. Next, we place the retaining ring on top of the sample ring. And then we place these two thumb nuts on the threaded rods and tighten them down. We'll place another piece of filter paper on top of the specimen. Then we'll place the top stone in. And finally, on the very top goes our loading cap, which connects the load frame to the specimen. So now we have a complete assembled consolidation cell. This one doesn't have a real specimen in it, but that's what it looks like when it's assembled. Before we trim the soil specimen into the ring, I want to show you the dimensions of this ring. This is a relatively standard size ring. It has an inside diameter of two and a half inches, and it has a height or thickness of one inch. Before trimming the specimen into the consolidation ring, I need to measure the tear weight of the ring and record it on the data sheet. I also need to measure and record the tear weight of a water content 10, which I'll use to determine the water content of the specimen before consolidation. So now I'm going to trim a specimen into the ring. This is a sample that has been extruded from a Shelby tube, and now we're going to get a specimen of it into this ring. The sample is bigger in diameter than the ring. So now I'm going to set the ring on top of the sample so that there's soil around it all the way around. And then I'm going to push gently down on the ring to set it into the sample. And I'll take this wire saw and carefully trim around the edges of the sample. And I'll trim just little pieces of it off as I go around. Once I've trimmed all the way around the sample, I push the ring in a little further, and then I start trimming again. It's important when I trim that I don't cut too far into the sample, or else I'll undercut the part in the ring and the sample won't fit in properly.
And once again, I'll push the ring a little further into the specimen and continue trimming. And as I trim, I'll put some of the trimmings into the water content tin, which I've already teared. This will allow me to get an initial water content of the specimen. You don't need to collect all of the trimmings, just enough for a water content sample. When I'm through trimming the ring into the Shelby tube sample, I'll have a little bit of the soil extruding out of the top, and you'll see some of the extra trimmings down here at the bottom. Now those of you with eagle eyes will notice that this isn't the same specimen that I started with earlier. I'm using a specimen that I'd already trimmed into the ring to make things a little faster. The next thing I'm going to do is to cut the excess sample off of the bottom. To do that, I'll use a wire saw. I'm going to cut the sample off about a quarter of an inch or five centimeters below the bottom of the ring. I'll just pull the wire saw across to do that. And once I've got it cut all the way through, I just lift the top off. It looks like I'm going to have to cut the, the specimen a second time to get it off. So there's my specimen now trimmed into the ring. Now I still need to trim the top and the bottom off of the specimen so they're flush with the ring. So the specimen has been trimmed into the ring and now I just need to trim the top and the bottom to get it flush with the edges of the ring. I'm going to put the trimmings in this water content tin so I can measure the water content of the sample before testing. And I'll use a good sharp soil knife to trim the specimen. You don't want to just take the knife and trim it all in one cut because you'll tear the specimen and leave divots in it. So work carefully around the edges putting the trimmings in the water content tin as you go. You don't need to get all of the soil into the water content tin, just enough for a good water content measure. Keep working carefully and slowly, taking off a little bit of a time. Always work from the outside of the specimen towards the middle. This is a fairly soft specimen, so it's easy to work with. It's important that you keep your soil knife clean, otherwise it won't lead behind a good clean surface. In the end, what I want is a really nice flat surface at the top of the specimen. That looks like probably enough soil for my moisture content measurement. Again, I'm going to clean the knife off so that I get a good surface. Now that I'm at the very end of the trimming, I'll drag the knife slowly across the specimen to make sure that it's perfectly flush with the top of the ring. And there we have a nice specimen trim flush with the top. And now I'll just do the same thing with the bottom half. Once we're through trimming the top and the bottom, we need to remove the excess soil on the outside of the ring. This is most easily done with a moist sponge. Now we have our specimen properly trimmed in the ring with smooth surfaces on the top and bottom, and it needs to be weighed before going into the consolidation cell. Before we assemble the specimen in the cell, we need to take the weight of the water content sample
and the weight of the specimen trimmed into the ring. Now I'm going to show you how to properly assemble a consolidation cell with the specimen we trimmed into the ring. To do this, I've got the consolidation cell and all its accessories. I have the specimen trimmed in the ring. I also have the top and bottom stones in this beaker of water. The water in the beaker was boiled for 10 minutes to ensure the water is de-aired and the stones are saturated. It was then cooled to room temperature. The beaker also contains the two pieces of filter paper we will need. The first thing to do is place the bottom stone in the consolidation cell. Next I'll place a piece of filter paper on the bottom stone and make sure it's centered on the stone. Now I'll place the ring with the trim specimen. And with the sharp edge up, I'll place it on top of the filter paper and make sure it's centered on the stone. Next I'll place the second piece of filter paper carefully on top of the specimen and ensure it's centered. I'll try and remove all the air bubbles from under the paper. Then I'll place the retaining ring on top. And place the thumb nuts on the two threaded rods and snug them down to secure the retaining ring. Next, I'll place the top pour stone on top of the filter paper. Then I'll place the top cap on top of the stone. And now the cell is all ready to be placed in the frame for testing. I'd like to now do a quick overview of the load frame that we're going to be using to load our specimen. This is a GeoJack system. It's made by Geotac slash Troutwine out of Houston, Texas. This is an automated system that will automatically load our specimen and take all the data. There are other systems out there that use dead weights and are manually loaded, or you have to read the data manually off a dial gauge. In this case, we're using an automated system that takes all the data for us. It makes life a lot easier. What we'll be doing is placing our specimen here underneath the load cell at the bottom of the loading frame. I'll go over the details of this in a few minutes, but I just want to overview the system now. Just above where our specimen is, is the load cell. This is a device that will actually measure the force applied to the top of the specimen. And since we know the cross-sectional area of the specimen, then we can get the stress applied to the specimen. The other thing we need to measure is the displacement of the specimen as it consolidates. This device at the top is a displacement measuring device it measures the displacement here at the top of the load frame, but this piston is connected directly all the way through the load frame so that the displacement at the top here is the same as the displacement at the top of the specimen. So this will measure the deformation of the specimen. Of course, the other thing we need to know is time, and that will be recorded on our data acquisition system. This computer over here is our data acquisition system. It's running the software that controls the GeoJack and, and runs the whole test for us. So this is an automated system. It's really nice. Uh, below the table, we got a whole bunch of uh, power supplies and, and signal conditioning equipment and stuff that actually does all the actual measurements. But you don't need to worry about that. The lab techs already set it up for us, so it's ready to go. So this is the system we'll be using, this automated system. And I'll go over the details of how to get the specimen there in just a minute. Before placing the consolidation cell into the load frame, we place the stainless steel ball in the indentation in the loading cap and place this adapter on top of the ball. 
The adapter moves to ensure the load is applied vertically to the cap. We then slide the consolidation cell underneath the load frame and make sure it's perfectly lined up with the loading piston. You'll need to look at it from two different directions to make sure it's lined up correctly. Now we'll use the controls in the computer program to move the piston down until it's approximately one millimeter above the loading cap. Now we'll use the manual controls to move the loading piston until it's about one millimeter above the adapter on the top cap. Using the manual controls, we carefully move the piston down. That looks about right. Now that we have the specimen all prepared and in the load frame, we just need to set up the program that controls the loading sequence and will be off and running, or off and consolidating that is. This particular system runs Geotax software, but other automated systems are set up similarly. First, we'll have to enter the data about the specimen. The top five entries are just text data that identify the project, boring, sample, and specimen information. The next two entries are critical. The diameter is essential because the program will use that to convert applied force to applied stress. The initial height is critical to calculating the strain in the specimen. Once we've entered the specimen data, we need to tell the program what the loading sequence will be and how often to take readings. For the loading sequence, we'll start with a seating load of 100 PSF and then use a load increment ratio of 2, that is double the load each step. We'll load up to 12,800 PSF and then we'll unload in two steps down to 400 PSF. To set up the reading times, it's important to remember that, according to Tertsagi's theory, the consolidation versus time relationship will have an S-shape when plotted as the log of time, as shown in this curve. Since this is a logarithmic function, we want our readings to be spaced out equally in log space, not arithmetic space. That is, we want to take readings that follow a geometric pattern, such as 1 minute, 2 minutes, 4 minutes, 8 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 1 hour, 2 hours, etc. If we were to take readings every minute, we would have way too many readings when we get out to the end of the curve. The red dots here show a typical sequence of time readings. And we'll enter the sequence in the program here. Once the loading and reading data are entered, our computer screen will look like this, and all we need to do is click Start Test, and the program will start the loading sequence. Okay, our seating load has been placed, and now I need to fill the cell with water. The water doesn't need to come up all the way to the top of the cell. You just got to be sure it's above this little hole in the retaining ring uh, to ensure that the water is above the top of the specimen. And our test is off and running. At each loading step, the program will maintain the appropriate applied stress, collect the deformation versus time data, and generate a plot similar to this one. You can see from this plot that this particular load has reached 100% consolidation as shown by the red line. After the first loading step is complete, the program will continue loading through each step up to our maximum stress of 12,800 PSF. At each step, the program will collect deformation versus time data as shown here. After the peak load, the program will unload the specimen in two steps to a stress of 400 PSF. After the loading sequence is complete and the specimen is unloaded, the program is able to generate a preliminary strain versus log stress plot as shown here. 
This isn't the final strain versus log stress plot. We need to review and reduce all the data to get a final version, but this preliminary plot gives us a good idea of what the final data will look like. In this particular specimen, we see a sharp pre-consolidation stress, sigma prime c, followed by a consolidation along the virgin curve. The specimen then unloads upon a much stiffer curve, just as we would expect. Well, now the program has collected all the data we need for our consolidation curve. The only thing left to do is to remove the specimen from the test frame, take our final readings on the specimen, and then reduce the data. To remove the specimen from the loading frame, first I'll raise the loading piston using the manual controls. You can see the piston rising up. And now I can simply pull the consolidation cell out from the load frame. I can then empty the water out of the cell and remove the specimen from the consolidation cell. Now we're ready to remove the specimen from the cell. The first thing I do is take the loading cap off. And next I'm going to unscrew these thumb screws that hold the retaining ring on the top. And then I had to take my specimen out very carefully. And so if I turn this upside down, the top stone should come out. So here's my specimen in the ring. I need to remove the excess water from this, so I'm just going to use a towel to remove the excess water from the ring. And then I need to remove the filter paper from the bottom because when I did the tear of the ring, it didn't have the filter paper on it, so I'll remove the filter paper off the bottom. It doesn't look like there's really any excess water left there. Then I'll carefully remove the filter paper off the top. There's a little bit of excess water on the top of the specimen there. So I'm just going to use a paper towel and touch it on the top. Let it absorb all the excess water, because that's not really part of the specimen, that's just water that was sitting on top of the specimen from the stone. It doesn't matter if I disturb the sample now, because all we're trying to do now is get a final weight for the specimen. So now I'm ready to go get a final weight for the specimen. So now I'm going to get a mass of the specimen in the ring after the test. Just do this the same way I got the tear weight of the ring before. Be sure to record that data properly on the data sheet. And I'll take that specimen now and place it in a pan that I'll put in the oven. And I'll take this over to our oven and dry it out and tomorrow I'll get a dry weight of the specimen with the ring. So here's my specimen that I just got the weight of. I'm going to put it in our oven here. So I can do our water content. I'm sure this is a test you've all done a bunch of times. So this is pretty simple. Turn the oven on. And we'll come back tomorrow, it'll be dry, and we'll take a weight of the dry specimen with the ring tomorrow so we can find the water content of the specimen at the end of the test. Okay, it's been a day since we put our specimens in the oven and they should be dry and ready uh, for the water content determination. <laughs> So I'm just going to take these out and let them cool, and then we'll do our measurements. All right, our specimen has been dried out in the oven, and now I can take a final weight of the specimen. 
with the ring. Now, if you want to look at our specimen here, it shrunk quite a bit, having dried out. And that's what it looks like in the end after it's been consolidated and dried out. A little red hockey puck. Before we finish this webcast, let's review the learning objectives and talk a little bit about next steps. The first objective was to describe the components of a floating ring consolidation cell. You should be able to do this now. The second learning objective was to describe how to prepare a specimen for 1D consolidation testing. And I hope you're able to do this now too. Now that you've completed the test, the next step is to reduce the data and compute the final results. There are two steps in this process. The first step must be repeated for each load increment in a test. In this step, you convert the raw data from the testing program into plots of deformation versus log time, as shown in this figure. From this figure, you are able to determine the deformation at 100% consolidation, delta 100, and the coefficient of consolidation, C sub V. Details of these computations are in your textbook or lab manual. Once you've completed these computations for every load increment, you can proceed to the second step, which is to use the delta 100 data from all the load increments to create a strain versus log stress curve as shown here. It's important to realize that each point on the strain versus log stress curve comes from the plot of deformation versus log time for a given load increment. I'll provide a separate webcast to go over the details of these computations. I hope you've enjoyed this webcast and that it has helped you to understand the 1D Consolidation Lab Test. Have a great day.